Hello? Okay. Okay. So, so I just hit the table there. I just looked at my recording from last week, and I discovered that, that there are lots of issues with the microphone going in and out. So, hold on. It's really dark now. Is that any better? That is not any better. It's a very dark day today. Um, hmm. What can I do about this? Um, let's see. Oh. Okay, so unfortunately today it's a rather rainy day or cloudy day. So I guess it's not a light source. It's very obvious. Okay, well that's doable. Okay, so so anyway, I discovered that my uh, my uh, audio, my microphone was cutting in and out on the last video. So a, I'm going to try not to touch my desk too much. But uh, starting, well, this is the last of our advanced emotion set. And we, I'm doing this a day early so I can kind of get this done and kind of move on because it was very emotional to run through each one of these exercises uh, once a week. So uh, I kind of just want to take a little break. Um, uh, and I'm starting to do this again in, the, in August uh, for free. I'm going to do all these classes for free starting in August, and I want to offer these services more to people. And so anyway, so, so anyway, all that's to say, this is the last video like this, and I am going to, uh, starting, I'm going to go buy a new microphone and a new setup. I've been watching people on TV and what their setup is. So I, I got some ideas about what I'm going to do for my new setup and probably buying a new web camera also. So, uh, so yeah, so, so when I, when I make the next version of these, these recordings, hopefully they will be of much better quality. Okay. So. Anyway, if you're watching this, thank you for, for watching it, for putting up with it. Hopefully this information is useful and helpful for you. This is the final of our Advanced Emotions for Dummies uh, course. And in this, final, um, in this final class, we will be discussing uh, relationships and deconstructing beliefs. Okay. Uh, at this point, you should probably watch a previous video if you don't know who I am, but my name is Donnie or Dr. Donnie, and I'm a college professor, a sociology professor at CSU East Bay and Hayward, and I focus on social emotional learning, which is all about learning how to get in touch with your feelings, questioning your thoughts, learning how to heal from traumatic experiences, childhood, childhood wounds, getting in touch with your inner child, all that good stuff. Okay. Okay, so this, this, this one's going to be relatively short because it's the last one of the series. In my uh, Emotions for Dummies class, uh, it's all about building up the exercises toward one really big culmination exercise at the end. But in this class, each class itself is kind of like a big ba-boom in itself, okay? So actually, why don't we go, why don't we get started and take a look at table of contents of what we were what we've been doing over the course of our time. Now I meant to pull this up. Hold on one second. One second, please. Is that what this is? I just gotta confirm that this is here. My computer is uh my computer has 20 million windows open, so needless to say I probably should really uh should, should do something about that. But uh, <laughs> okay, let's see. I'll share the screen.
There we go. So like I said, all these exercises come from the book of you. Also, again, apologies if my microphone is cutting in and out because I'm doing this to my desk. Okay. Let's see. One, one second. Here. Let me fix a couple of things. Let me just do that. Okay. You know, I'd be seeing people on, on TV now who have the most amazing setups. They have really amazing professional microphones and, and uh, you know, stereo quality sound and audio. And I'm so happy for them. And, and I probably could do the same thing. I mean, my, my university will probably give me the budget to just get those things myself. It's just, um, it's just part of me kind of doesn't give a fuck. That's just kind of the truth of it, really. <laughs> so we'll see. Anyway, so here's the book of you. And uh, we've been working through these exercises in this book. This is the social emotional workbook I put together. So we went through several things in this class, but one of the most important things was our self care plan. So let me just say some words about that. You know, every class we thought about what would trigger us, how can we deal with those triggers, what are the honest ways we deal with those triggers. And then what would the healthier options be for dealing with those triggers, okay? So, you know, it's always useful to ask yourself, when I feel something I can't handle, what do I honestly do? And then what would be a healthier go-to? Okay, so uh, when I feel something I can't handle, I honestly might just binge eat a bunch of food and watch TV all day, okay? But a healthier option might be to take time out to sit with my feelings, a healthier option might be to call a friend for a little while. A healthier option might be taking your mind off of it for a little bit, and maybe uh, getting in some activity, going to the beach, going, going to take a walk at, around the park or something, focusing on your uh, physical health for a little bit, and then returning to the problem later. Okay. Okay. So there was when I feel something I can't handle. What do you do? And then when I can tell I'm about to cry, when I can tell I'm about to cry, what do you do? Okay, so those are just useful things to always think about uh, in life and when you take these classes, because they're all about your feelings. So if you can tell that you're about to, uh, when you feel things that are just difficult, just be really honest with yourself about how do you deal with those things, okay? These classes have been very triggering, so it's very important to know that stuff. Okay, so like I said, the first Emotions for Dummies series all deals with part one of this workbook. So we can revisit that some other time. And the advanced series we've been going through is part two of this workbook. So class one was inner baby work and emotional abuse. Class two was inner child work. Class three is grief and recovery. And then today what we're going to do is we're going to look at deconstructing beliefs deconstructing beliefs, and uh, uh, story-based strategy, okay? And then at some point, I'm going to put this workbook out for everyone to have access to. I think I'll just put a link. I'm, I'm turning it into an app, but, but uh, um, for the time being, I'll just put a link. And then you can take a look at this, all the other exercises in this workbook, okay? But anyway, so today is deconstructing beliefs and story-based strategy. So here we go. Page 45. So, like I always say for every class, if you feel like reading alone, feel free. But if not, you can always just close your eyes and relax and, and uh, just let yourself let these words just sink, bypass the brain and sink into the heart. Okay. And I'll just say that if there's any audio problems with this, with this recording, uh, I just want to say that uh, I will, there won't be audio problems in the future recordings, okay? I promise you that. It'll be the same material, actually. There won't be any audio problems. So thank you uh, for your patience. Okay, so I put a whole worksheet here on deconstructing beliefs, and this comes from several sources. One is a couple of YouTube videos I found of Byron Katie. Also the book, I don't want to, I don't 
feel like it, how resistance controls your life and what to do about it by Sherry Cooper. Uh, someone I someone I got introduced to at a, a retreat uh, recently. And then uh, the, uh, there's a few lines from the Tao Te Ching, of which I have a Stephen Mitchell version of. And the Tao Te Ching, um, Stephen Mitchell is Byron Katie's husband, who I met when I invited her to my college campus. Okay. So it says in the beginning here, note, feel free to exchange the word God for any other terms that work for you. Any other terms that work for you. Oops, there's a typo there. Okay, so um, so I'm gonna use the word God, but I'm also gonna use the word love as well. I'll use those back and forth, okay? Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> While all religions preach a universal truth, called God, Muhammad, the universe, Tao, love, etc. In our everyday lives, our everyday religion is the beliefs we place onto everything. Beliefs we give so much meaning, we begin to see them as who we are, or how the world works, or what is just true about life. However, strong beliefs are not reality. A belief is just a thought that you have put on repeat so often you insist its meaning must be true, provable, and universal, which strengthens a mental pathway that blocks out or fights things that run counter to the belief. Since the human mind can't perceive actual reality, only the meanings we give to thoughts and feelings, then our entire sense of reality is all of our beliefs. Without a belief about classrooms, this might be called a space. But without a belief about space, this is called called the sound of a a squirrel. <laughs> can you still hear the squirrel? I can still hear the squirrel. Hey, you know what? The squirrel is going to be part of our experience today. That's going to honor that squirrel energy. Okay, what I believe uh, about classrooms, this might be called a space, but without a belief about space, then this is called. If I couldn't call this piece of paper in my hand paper, it would be. In fact, if you drop all the meanings, everything you are thinking, life is just. Most of life is air moving and ambient noise. So beyond belief, reality is both nameless and all inclusive. Reali reality is nothing, no thing. It's just what is. Our strong beliefs about ourselves in the world often come from our childhood socialization. As we are socialized in childhood, our ability to think begins to crystallize into learning, meanings, beliefs, and concepts. From our beliefs, we shape judgments on the ability to compare and evaluate ourselves and others. And then identifying with those judgments becomes our personality and worldview. Once our mind shapes our sense of reality, our feelings kick in so that we can act to protect our boundaries. Think, feel, then act. For example, it turns out that shame is related to our beliefs. When we acknowledge our faults, limitations, humanness, shame is actually healthy. When we feel the need to lie and hide our true self, shame becomes toxic. All our stressful, repressive beliefs come from the five frustrations of life, our assumptions, preferences, attachments, comparisons, and control. Hmm. Ain't that truth? Okay. Whew. Whew. okay, we get so caught up in what we make things mean that instead of questioning our belief system, we'd rather blame others or reality when things don't work out. However, being willing to question beliefs is the only way we can allow ourselves to stop filling our ego with confusing, contradictory thoughts 
and allow it to support our heart, inner child, in a healthy way. Some of our strongest beliefs are about our identity. Our ego is strongly attached to who we think we are. However, if beliefs are thoughts and thoughts are not real, then our ego identity is not real either. It's just the byproduct, the coping mechanism of our socialization and thought patterns. Beliefs give meaning to the ego, creating a false sense of realness, like in the emperor has no clothes. So to keep that power, ego uses the five frustrations of life to make everything about ourselves. Once we believe it's about us, we have no choice but to judge, react from that position, even if it confuses us or feels bad. Each judgment is a post-it note or memo, literally a memo, that creates the ego's sense of world or reality. So it is guaranteed that it will resist change, maturity, and do the opposite of what is best for us. Because to do otherwise would mean releasing the control. Hmm. This is why we can't just fix ourselves. That is ego fixing ego. This is why the biggest belief worth questioning is if there is even an I or a you in the first place. Beyond belief, beyond the memos, who we are, who anyone is, is nothingness, no thing, or infinite possibility, like the space in a bowl or the hole in a doorway or window. No more inner or outer arguments or stress, just being present with life as it is, a living state of total rest and peace, like Jesus are one of no repression, judgment, or meanings, just love and innocence like a child. Hmm. Hmm. Byron Katie often says that another word for reality is God itself, because both are what is and beyond our ability to comprehend with beliefs. In fact, beliefs only get in the way of the real experience of reality, God itself. Beyond belief, God can only be a symbol which represents both everything and nothing at the same time. Omnipotent, an all-encompassing meaning or oneness. Connecting this to childhood socialization, if our parents shape our sense of the universe in a negative parental relationship means a negative belief in the universe, then we can expand this to say, all of our negative beliefs about life are ultimately distorted meanings about our connection to this oneness, our heavenly father. We use abuse our ego by using beliefs to separate from and act as God, which is the original sin, an impossible joke or a shameful, hopeless Arguing with people's beliefs is exactly like arguing with the rain. It's not a good way to deal with your feelings, and that oneness isn't going to change at all. If the experience of God itself is beyond belief, and beliefs are repressive, then perhaps we shouldn't have any beliefs at all. According to this logic, by giving up, by giving up beliefs altogether, you are free living God's purpose for you by just being fully open to the present moment. Or as Miss BK says, only the ego speaks and nothing the ego says is true. So therefore, a mind is a wonderful thing to lose. <laughs> <sighs> okay. We like to praise God when we get what we want but often wonder why does God allow bad things to happen? If winning a Grammy is God's will, then so must be all the poverty, violence, and other injustices. If God is everything, then the higher power must always hear us and give us what we want. It just may never come the way we wanted it or have the effect we wanted it to have, and it may come with all sorts of unexpected consequences. Ain't that the truth? 
And this is because of the role that our negative beliefs or judgments play in directing our lives. Being consciously critical can help make you a great student or professor, but since our reality is our thoughts and the mind is 80% unconscious, this makes judgment a very powerful tool that actually turns you into the thing you judge. If I judge you as mean or hurtful, I become mean and hurt you. If I judge myself as not good enough, the mind will find all the reasons why I am right, feel bad, won't try in life, and then won't be good enough. One way to see the effect of our negative beliefs is to examine our complaining and defensive behaviors. This shows us how our resentments, regrets, fears, and other unconscious commitments can cause, cause confusion in our lives. Ultimately, whatever awful thing happens, awful is a judgment. Without being able to call it awful, its meaning would just be This is why awful can mean both bad and inspiring. If we open our minds to the good or the God of the situation, we can use even the bitter, sour lemons of life as potential for sweet lemonade. Okay, so all this might sound really out there, but what is clear is that if we unlearn by deconstructing our beliefs, we can live more in harmony with the world the way things are instead of fighting about how they should be. And if all this is true, then dropping all our I know judgments and moving to a permanent don't know open-mindedness is the quickest way to fall in love with life, free ourselves from codependent thinking, and strengthen our faith. A don't know mind is the demonstration of totally healthy shame. Because a person who realizes the limitations of all their beliefs can only live in present moment reality, this here now, or literally follow in the steps of God. Okay, that's deep. So I'm going to read that one more time. <clears throat> a don't know mind is the demonstration of totally healthy shame. Because a person who realizes the limitations of all their beliefs can only live in present moment reality, this here now, or literally follow in the steps of God. Whatever happens in life, we all have a holy trinity of questioning thoughts, space to feel our feelings, and time to rest in our self-care toolkit. Our God, Son, Holy Spirit equals thoughts, feelings, rest. Okay, so this exercise will help you deconstruct any beliefs you are holding by finding their opposite or making positive affirmations. And I recommend Googling uh, Louise Hay, which you don't know who that is. She's a person who does positive, positive thinking stuff. But uh, some of that stuff's useful. You might not like all of it, but it's just one thing to learn to see if you can get any benefit out of it, okay? Particularly focus on any beliefs you have held from childhood to today. Also, no belief is too simple. Even the sky is blue is worth questioning and feeling through. Finding your internal truth may not be what the world would say is true, and it may or may not change what you do in life, but inquiring will help you build a healthier belief system, or, or that is, one more in line with reality. Okay, so that's some deep ass stuff going on in that worksheet. So I highly would recommend going back to reread that because I put a lot of time into kind of digging into all that stuff there, okay? But basically you can, I figured out a way to combine both the Christian and the, the Buddhist sort of worldview um, by connecting it all to this stuff about thoughts and feelings and, and beliefs. Beliefs is kind of the thing that connects it all together. Okay, so feel free to go back and reread re -read all that. The main point is, it's really useful to question all of our beliefs, especially the ones that we really don't want to question. Those are the really useful ones to question, okay? If you would like to live, to abandon the belief and live more in harmony with the world, the world does not go according to beliefs. The world's just going through a long, well, the world's going along with lots of people's beliefs, but the world can do all sorts of things, right? The belief 
automatically anchors you in one fixed position. So then all you can do at that point is see the world and say, I agree or I disagree. Yes, no. And that kind of seeing the world that way is not about the world, it's about the belief we shaped, right? So if we're willing to question and alter and expand and maybe nuance our beliefs, then we can uh, live a lot more in harmony with, uh, with reality instead of fighting and arguing with reality. Okay, and that's the idea there anyway. Okay, so here's the worksheet. The worksheet is first, what is the belief? It can be a statement like, I need people to like me or a word, approval, need sleep. And it can be about you or others, like Fat Fatima can do it by herself, or people suck. Beliefs often involve extreme needs, wants, or complaints that use exaggerated language like always, never, must, gotta, can't, really should, and shouldn't. Write it in one sentence. Two is, what is the story about this belief? Why do you have it? Explain how you feel when you get it. Or people give you your belief and what you feel when you don't get your belief. Three, using your story, write out all the associations you have with this belief. Uh, so the example I gave is, I need people to like me equals safe and friendly. People disliking me equals danger and cold. You only need three positive and three negative associations at the most. Then, now each association has two opposites. So flip one part of each association to get each one. So liking me equals safe and friendly would become both liking me equals unsafe, unfriendly, and disliking me equals safe and friendly, okay? Another association, disliking me equals danger and cold, would be disliking me equals safe and warm, and liking me equals danger and cold. Okay, so I think you can see there, I, I took one part of each of those associations and I flipped it around to the other thing, okay? And it produces all these statements that look a little odd. Disliking me equals safe and friendly, okay? But that's the point, okay? Then here we go, go to each one of those flipped opposites, get still and sink in and find a reason why it is true. Okay. Then next, find a reason why it is good that each of those flipped opposites is true. You may feel your ego explode. And then there's an exercise at the bottom, but we will take a look at that in one second. Okay, so let's give this a shot. What's the belief that uh, I'm holding on to right now? And I'm gonna work on for this example. Um, uh, let's see, I believe. So I just moved here to Santa Cruz and you know, I don't know if any of you know anything about Santa Cruz, California, but Santa Cruz has a literal 2% black population. And so for the, you know, and of all the things in the world, I moved here, I started looking for an apartment here. I've never been here before. So I come here to go to the beach like around the same time as the riots were happening and I went to look for an apartment around that time and, and uh, you know, all this Black Lives Matter stuff is going on and, and you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, since the, the lynchings happened in the news, I went off into a place of a lot of fear. And so it's very uh, scary to be a black person moving into a predominantly white space, if you ask me. And so I've been working through a lot of fear, you know, and, you know, just the daily reality of being here and walking around and being the, the one black guy in a space. It's just quite common here. Although to be fair, I've walked around every day and seen several other black people. Again, it's a 2% black population. So, so I've been walking around with a lot of, of, of working through a lot of fear. I've been working through a lot of fear. Sometimes that fear has been so crippling that I, I don't want to leave my house because I'm just, I just feel like at any given moment, somebody's going to like give me the startled to see a black person reaction. And then if you get a few of those, I, I start getting to a place where I'm like, what's the point of going out at all? Or that's what came up for me over the last week. Uh, okay, look, look, so that's a story. What's the point 
what's the point of going out at all if people are so racist and mean? So my belief is, my belief is people are so racist and mean. Oops. Sorry. People are so racist and mean, it's not worth going out. I'm going to summarize that real nice and succinctly for myself here. Okay, uh, we're, good. we're good. People are so racist and mean. Here we go. People are so racist and mean, it's not worth going out. Okay. Two, what's the story? So I'm just going to say some of the things I just said. Um, I feel uncomfortable. Black populations, and there is so much stuff around race going on in the country. I worry that I worry for my safety. I worry for my safety when I go outside often. I worry that I will have to deal with white people or, or that I will need help and no one will help me. Or even just be friendly. Or just get my everyday black realities. Okay, that's good. I feel uncomfortable being in a town with a tiny black population. There's so much stuff around race going on in the country. I worry for my safety when I go outside often. I worry that I will have to deal with racist white people or that I will need help and no one will help me or just be friendly or just get, get my everyday black reality. Deal, that's how I feel. Why do I, now, why do I have this? Oh, hold on. I have this belief because of previous experiences with racism. Fair enough. And how do you feel when you get or people give you belief? And what do you feel when you don't get your belief? When people agree with my uncomfortability. That's probably not so right. Comfortability, I feel validated and relieved. Or uh, validated and supported. But when they disagree with me being uncomfortable, I feel rejected, pissed, like I gotta argue with them. Or it's hopeless. Hopeless to get them to understand. Ooh, we'll let all that out. Okay. Okay, that's, that, that pretty much explains all that there, right? So now, using this story, write out all the associations you, ha you have with this belief. So, what I'm seeing here is... Uh... Well, what I'm seeing here is, is racist people equal, racist people equal uncomfortable, uncom worry, no help, or friendliness, 
no help or friendliness or getting everyday reality. And then I guess we could also say rejected, kissed, and hopeless. Okay. And then the flip side of this is, well, I guess that, that well, hold on, hold on. Well, this, this not worth going out, we can just, Uncomfortable, worry, no help, feelings, reality, rejected, pissed, hopeless, not worth going out. Not worth going out. And so, consequently, the opposite of racist, so non, should I, should maybe I should not have said racist? All right, let's do this. Let's say racist people. No go out equals all this stuff. Okay. Now, what would be the opposite? Oh, hold on. I'm so sorry. Racist mean people equals no go out. <laughs> Racist mean people no go out equals all this stuff that we said. Okay. So maybe uh, with the opposite of racist, I guess it's open. Open. Open-minded people go out equals going go out equals comfortable. No worry. Help. Friendliness. Getting my reality. Accepted. We said, well, I said, well, validated, actually, that's what I said, validated. Validated, supported. Okay, so that wasn't a difficult thing, okay? I had to do some organization, and I wasn't exactly sure what to put in which spot exactly at first. But you see, the general thing I did was I took what I said here about the beliefs, and then I summarized it right here, and then I wrote out the story. Okay. Okay, and then what I did was, now I could have technically gone ahead and, because uh, this is kind of the story here, right here. But I tried to look for any uh, positive associations, and so what I did, because there wasn't, there wasn't many, <laughs> there aren't many positive associations in this, and so I, I just took what I wrote in the belief, and then I turned it around to an opposite, okay? And then I kind of found the opposite of several of these things. And I did that for a reason, because the next part of this is, each association has two opposites, flip one part of each association to get each one. Okay, so that's gonna look like this. Racist mean people no go out equals all this stuff here. Okay. And open minded people go out equals all this stuff here. Okay, so this is literally taking the belief, taking the belief and turning it around, okay, flipping it around. That's literally what this is, right? You saw how that process worked. I literally took the belief and flipped it around. Okay, so now this is the meditation of this exercise, is to go to each one of these, get still and sink in, and find a reason why it's true. Okay, so notice your breath. <sighs> Return to the breath whenever you need to meditate. You don't even have to close your eyes. All you have to do is focus on your breath. You are breathing whether you want to or not. So it's the quickest way to connect right into the present moment. It has brought up several feelings for me, I'm noticing. Am I, the 
the stress of the last few weeks of my life, the stress I feel around being sort of singled out. stress I feel around historical trauma around black people and slavery. The fact that we are in 2020 and we're still dealing with stuff like this 1920, 1945 all over again. Like we never had a civil rights movement sometimes. It's amazing. The fact that we live in a world where so much queer acceptance has happened and yet so much racial acceptance has not. That's also another sad thing too. Okay, so racist mean people means I don't go out. Why is it true that that is comfortable? Why is it true that that is comfortable? No worries. Why is it helping? Okay, let's see. Well, first of all, it's comfortable because I don't have to get my worldview challenged at all. I don't have to deal with you know, like Trump supporter people, the anti-mask wearing people. These are all groups that I'm having a, I'm having a hard time discerning what the logic. Well, there's not much, I'm, the logic, I'm having a hard time with that. But then when I sink into the feelings, I get the anger. It just seems very misplaced to me. So, so it, it does make me very uncomfortable to have to deal with those sorts of people. So I'm definitely avoiding, I'm definitely trying to stay comfortable by avoiding that. I worry less because the more I see those people, I can definitely say the YouTube videos I've watched with people arguing at stores and stuff makes me worry more. So not going out is definitely making me worry less. Okay. It's helping me, definitely helping me to feel better. It's, it's keeping me friendly because if I was dealing with that all the time, I might become a lot less friendly. It's teaching me that I get my own reality. Like by that, or or maybe it's teaching me that the importance of of uh, the importance of me getting me my own reality instead of hoping other people will get my reality, and I'm the one who needs to get my reality. I'm the one who needs to get it 100. percent I'm, I'm, I'm so so okay. So what I would say is, races mean people. If I get so concerned by, about this and I'm not going out, the lesson I'm really learning is how to listen to myself, how to get in touch with me, how to get in touch with me, what matters to me, what my fears are, what I need for real support, instead of throwing that on the world and racist people. That's, that's what I can see on that so far, okay? Okay, so here's the other one. Uh, Open-minded people, I mean, open-minded people, I do go out, that equals uncomfortable. How is that true? Hmm. Well, one, if I go out and, and, and there's people I want to be around, I have to risk being open, being vulnerable. I have to risk, yeah, I have to, I have to be vulnerable to talk to people and get to know people, and that involves being uncomfortable. Going out and meeting new people often involves being uncomfortable and getting 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 comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, if you're not good at, at uh, if you're not good at being uncomfortable, you may worry. Um, people might be doing their own thing, so they may not help you. You know, they're doing their thing; they're focused on their priorities, so they may not be helpful or friendly, and they may not get your reality because they're so caught up on their own agenda. Hmm. That's very true. That's very true. I mean, you can be open-minded and very self-absorbed. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. If you've been to a if you've been to a college, you can definitely meet lots of people who've been open-minded and very self-absorbed. Okay. Okay, and, and people who are open-minded and very self-absorbed tend to do a lot of rejecting others. Dealing with other open-minded people can be very frustrating and can feel like we're not getting anywhere. So it can feel hopeless. So that's equally true as well. So what I'm getting out of this is what's really bugging me is how much I'm not listening to me, how much I'm throwing it on a certain group of people so that
they're sort of an easy target, really, because they're the most salient thing in my life. Um, and how I'm not moving myself in the direction that might be best for me, because frankly, it's a lot harder. <laughs> it's a lot harder to go hang out with open minded people and have to deal with with whatever may happen a lot more uncomfortable anyway. Okay. Okay, next, next, find a reason why it is good that each one of those flipped opposites is true. Okay, so why is it good that racist mean people no go out equals comfortable? Well, it's good because, because I, because, because I got it, I, I'm open-minded enough to see what these people were about, and I saw that they're not about what I'm interested in. And so for that reason, I'm moving on to something else. So that's a really good thing. All those things. No worry, help, friendliness, getting my reality, validated, supported. It's teaching me to look, look toward me instead of trying to throw it on groups of people I don't agree with. And then why is it, why is it good? Why is it good that open-minded people, me go out, equals uncomfortable, worry, no help? Why is that good? Well, it's good because moving in the direction of your actual goals, dreams, things that may help you in life often involves meaning having to grow. It means having to bend, having to grow, having to learn. Yeah, change, shape, develop, develop. And so, so that is the work. That is the work we're getting in touch with uh, building a real life, building a real life. Not just what you hate and trying to tear down what you hate, but actually building up something that you love, building up the things you love. Yeah, building up the things you love, working with other like people, like working with other professors or working with other activists. Sometimes these can be the absolute most frustrating experiences ever. Because you all largely agree, but then you'll start arguing out some of the most nuanced little details. Or one person will use their ego to just decide how they're going to run the situation. Or there will, there will have been a whole meeting that happened before you showed up where people networked their resources to see what they could get here and here. And so when the conversation happens, several parts of the conversation have already been discussed and negotiated. You know, and now you have to figure out a way to like argue your way through that. Okay, so anyway, 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 this this shows you the difficulties of of uh, of uh, getting in touch with the real life. Getting in touch with the real life. Okay, so now I felt my ego go a little poof, a little bit, not a big one though, just a little. So let's go back to the belief again. The belief was people are so racist and mean, it's not worth going out. So I'll just ask, people are so racist and mean, it's not worth going out. Is that true? I'm gonna reset all this. People are so racist and mean, it's not worth going out. Is that true? No, no, it's definitely worth going out it's definitely worth going out it's definitely it's definitely uh, I'm definitely learning and growing and developing and it makes me uncomfortable but I'm learning and growing and that's an important part of uncomfortability is an important part of that process there's all sorts of wonderful people in the world and if I just focus on the ones I don't like I'll never meet the ones I do like I absolutely do do need to take, pay attention to the feelings that are coming up for me and learn how to take care of myself, practice better self-care when I deal with the things I don't like. Because those things are going to keep happening. So I have to think about how can I love myself through them so I can keep myself open to more opportunities instead of shut down. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. So now there's one more thing here. Also, you can try this practice of non-attachment. Name something that bothers you and say, if I couldn't call it 
this, it would be what? See if another word appears. Repeat the question over and over. You may end up repeating a word or saying it's opposite. Just keep digging. See how long it takes to get to nothingness. This is great for worries. Okay. Okay, so oh, let's say if I couldn't call it racism, let's go with racism. Well, one other thing is I noticed so far since I lived here, white culture is designed to very like avoid race in a lot of ways. So um, that's really unfortunate in 2020 when that's such a critical and has always been such a critical issue in our culture, right? So um, I don't know. I just want to. I just want to just. I'm I'm, go, I'm. I'm being very direct with race today, and I'm very glad that I can do that, both as a sociologist and as a, a black person. But uh, I just, I just, just wanted to put it out there for white people that we really got to. Many white people are so uncomfortable just saying the word race or saying as a white person. And I just, I just, best of luck, white people, okay? <laughs> best of luck in the, the, the future of America, of a brown America, with, without those tools, okay? Okay, anyway, so if I couldn't call it race, I would call it power. If I couldn't call it power, I would call it violence. If I couldn't call it violence, I would call it Conquest. If I couldn't call it conquest, I would call it greed. If I couldn't call it greed, I would call it selfish. I couldn't call it selfish, it would be needy. If I couldn't call it needy, it would be childish. And if I couldn't call it childish, it would be Simple. And if I couldn't call it simple, it would be human. And if I couldn't call it human, it would be life. And if I couldn't call it life, it would be Okay, okay, that's how that works. Okay, so you can do this with any anything you got going on. You know, if you couldn't call it school. If I couldn't call it school, it would be institutions. If I couldn't call it institutions, it would be forced learning. If I couldn't call it forced learning, it would be Stuck in a chair. If I couldn't call it stuck in a chair, it would be no rights. If I couldn't call it no rights, it would be no say. If I couldn't call it no say, it would be School sucks. If I couldn't call it school sucks, it would be disappointing. If I couldn't call it disappointing, it would be sad. If I couldn't call it sad, it would be tired. If I couldn't call it tired, it would be Stillness. And if I couldn't call it stillness, it would be maybe silence. And if I couldn't call it life, 
So I couldn't call it silence. It would be Okay, and also play with this idea, the practice of non-attachment. You know, the words you might have picked for the things, so I, you, you just saw my process, but you know, your words might have been very different. You might have had a whole different string of words. This unlocks all the attachments we have to our, to the words and the meanings and the feelings we have to them. All right, so just, just see, see how this kind of works for you. You may not have gotten to that silent space using my words, so try doing this using your own words. Okay, it's very easy to do. And if you find yourself worrying about something a lot, it literally unwinds the worry. So if you, uh, if this works, you might want to try it once a day. So you can uh, really ingrain yourself in the practice, okay? The first time I tried this beliefs exercise, my brain kind of popped, like I could feel a pop. And I was so moved, I did it several more times, but I also would say it, it kind of mentally hurt as well to do it. To, to do this exercise several times. So, so please take this exercise in whatever degree you can handle it, okay? Please take this exercise in whatever degree you can handle it. I think there's a smoke alarm somewhere around here. Okay. Please take this exercise in any way you can handle it. And again, share with others. Um, uh, Okay, and here's some uh, common thought distortions as well that might be useful to think about. What, what ways in which you engage in this kind of thinking patterns that are not helpful for you in your life? One is focusing on the negative. We often miss, reject, and or don't attend to positive experiences or feedback and focus on the negative, harder, difficult events or interactions. Okay, I'm definitely guilty of that, focusing on, on racism, right? All or nothing thinking. We overgeneralize our experience. The telltale signs are never and always. It's always going to be this way. It's never going to work out. Okay, three, believing that feelings are facts. Don't believe everything you feel. Just because you may feel that things won't get better doesn't mean it's true. Right? You can feel hopeless, but that doesn't tell you what the actual situation is. That just tells you what's going on in your brain, right? Next is mind reading. Often we make assumptions about the intent behind what someone has said or done without recognizing that we don't actually know what was going on for that person. Okay. We have to read people's minds. Many of us are guilty of that. Next is catastrophizing, a tendency to think in worst case scenarios. My headache is probably a brain tumor. Okay, that's when you think you have an STD and you go look it up on uh, WebMD and you freak out and think you have cancer, right? Next is feeling overly responsible. This is often behind the feeling that we can't take the time to take care of ourselves or we feel responsible for situations we have little control over. No matter how hard I work, I just can't save all the children. Okay. Feeling overly responsible. Next is waiting for heaven's reward. We expect our sacrifice and self-denial to pay off as if someone is keeping score. We feel bitter when the reward doesn't come. Okay. So that's, that's you did everything you could to be the good boyfriend or to be the good girlfriend. By now, he should have turned out to be Prince Charming, but, uh, but he's not. And so uh, now you're all super bitter, and, super bitter and pissed off because you, you felt like because you put all this work into it, you should have gotten what you wanted. Okay, that's what waiting for heaven's reward. That's what that is. And then the final one is predicting the future, and it's not good. We often don't realize as we've made up a whole storyline how things will unfold. And if depression and burnout are added in, we usually assume bad outcomes, okay? Some people predict the future and have grandiose visions of themselves always doing well no matter what happens. Um, God bless those people, okay? Those people, those people have other kinds of problems. 
most of us have 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 the problems of thinking too much in the in the in the negative. The human mind tends to think in negative more than anything else. Okay. Okay. So let's take a little break here, and this is our final exercise here: is uh, catch it, check it, change it. Okay. And it's all about story-based strategy. Okay, Oops, sorry about that. Okay, I'm, I'm doing this one as the last one instead of that relationship one because this connects to the beliefs thing we just talked about. This is all about deconstructing your view of yourself, that kind of thing. Whereas the, the relationship one is uh, it's just an inventory, so it's not that big a deal. Okay, so anyway, let's talk about the story based strategy. Um, yeah, why don't we just go ahead and get started? So I'm going to read this information as well, and you just go ahead and uh, listen along, and then there's an exercise at the end called Catch It, Check It, and Change It that we will do uh, with some story I have, okay? So, so we'll see. Okay, so here we go. Human beings just love to tell stories, and for good reason. Stories are the main way we organize our sense of identity, reality, and communicate it to others. We have a life story, a love story, a story about my childhood, a story about what happened at work, etc. Stories allow us to quickly enter a bunch of information into an easily identifiable format so we can exchange it with others for our emotional benefit. Stories are just as much about emotional information as they are about facts, description, or a plot line. Stories about our past or the historical past of your people, whatever that means for you, allows us to hold on to what we feel are important events that shaped us. However, because they are so helpful, stories can also be a great crutch. We not only use stories to make sense of who we are and what happened, we also use stories to justify our beliefs, prejudices, hold grudges, or otherwise stay stuck in a limited way of seeing things. The stories we shape about our pain, trauma, and fear can be some of the greatest coping mechanisms we have that keep our ego from letting go and flowing with life. You could essentially say this entire workbook or all these classes I teach is about examining all of our stories down to even our story of reality, the history of our feelings, the analysis of ourselves and others. Byron Katie often says, who would you be without your story? And the answer is, beyond all the thoughts, beliefs, concepts, stories we hold, we are nothingness, our infinite possibility, not held back by the past or afraid of the future, open to the present. <clears throat> the present moment is telling me my back is starting to hurt. So <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. The following information is from a group that focuses on telling stories to advance a political message. You can use this to break down any story and re-examine it for ways to empower yourself. Our different parts of ourselves may have different elements of the story to tell us, so you can use this exercise to also write out a story from a child part or as a feeling, like my angry side. All stories have a few basic elements, a conflict, characters, imagery, foreshadowing, and underlining assumptions. Well, most important, note how many times in your story that your characters are heroes, villains, and victims. Very often, our ego makes us the victims of our own stories as a way to stay in power. Just remember, your story is your interpretation of what you went through. It's not who you are. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So what, what, what you should do here is use the following space to write one of the stories you have about yourself. Use your grief timeline to help you. Then turn to the next page and examine your story using the check it and change it process. But first, let's do this. So as you can see here, here's the, the elements of a story. Conflict characters, imagery, foreshadowing, and underlining assumptions. Okay, so if I told a story 
Let's see a story I could tell. Well, I told a story about moving to Santa Cruz. So let me maybe, maybe, maybe I'll embellish that story a bit. So I moved here to Santa Cruz, and I told you I moved here during the riots, and I moved here, and I was concerned about being a, a black person in a predominantly white area, and I can add a few other, and I've gone around to a few places, and it, some of the racism made me shut down and want to stay home, and I'm working through that, uh, and I'm working through that. So let's just go with that part. That alone is a, is a story in itself, okay? So let's break that down. What is the conflict in that story? Well, one of the conflicts is race, my race versus a predominantly white area. Um, another conflict is my own fear, me wrestling with my own fear. Okay. And I guess you could say the fear of being in a new space also. It's another conflict. I also feel like there's some other conflict along the lines of like a um, uh, the conflict between picking the easy way versus actually pursuing your like dreams and ideas and moving into the places that make you uncomfortable. But that's a deeper thing I would know about my own story. I didn't tell that part necessarily. Okay. Okay. So next is characters. Who are the characters in this story? So there's me. There's Santa Cruz. There's um, uh, uh, racist people, <laughs> white people, racist white people. Okay, that's like five groups, really. Okay. Okay, next is imagery. What, what is the imagery? You can even say my fear is a character also in this story. Okay. Okay, next is imagery. What is, what is the imagery in this story? I mentioned riots. I mentioned you know, a predominantly white area. Okay. And I might have mentioned afraid to leave my house. So you can imagine a person staying in their house. Okay. And next is foreshadowing. Um, I think saying predominantly white area was foreshadowing for I'm afraid. I don't, you know, I've, I've said this to, to several, uh, a few white people, and they never see it as foreshadowing. But uh, I think when you say this to most people of color, they do see it as foreshadowing. Okay. Um, I guess I also so implied uh, that I'm working through my feelings, and so that I'm, the foreshadowing is that I will be a person working through these feelings as I live here. I think that's a pretty safe assumption there. But anyway, that's the next section is underlining assumptions. I, you know, I, I didn't tell you how long I'm staying here, but I'm here for a year. Okay, that's so underlining. So that's one, one assumption there. Another assumption is I didn't tell you this was a large town or a small town. I didn't tell you anything else about the resources that are here. I mostly moved here so I could spend time at the beach, okay, which is really cold, which is cold, but manageable. Okay. So, so there are all these underlining assumptions that I may not have mentioned, right? I didn't mention the, uh, the apartment complex I'm living in, um, what side of town I'm on. There's several things I didn't mention in that story. Okay. Okay, but the point there is you can break down any story into these five elements so you can understand what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, uh, and how we can retell the story that gives ourselves some more empowerment. And so that's what this does. It breaks it all down. So let's do this. First of all, the conflict. Is this the complete conflict? Um, I left out, well, like I said, I left out a few things around having money and enough money to make it in the Bay Area. So, so there's that. And moving from place to place every year. Uh, am I in the thought distortion of all or nothing in this story? Yes. There's this idea that I'm, I'm afraid and it's racist out there. And, and so it's all hopeless and I should just stay home. Stay safe and stay inside my house. It's full of COVID-19 people who don't want to wear a mask. And a lot of people here in Santa Cruz were not wearing masks. Okay. So yeah, there's a definitely all or, or nothing thinking here. Is there another way to frame the, the problem? Um, um now this might be a stretch, but part of me is kind of saying, 
instead of framing it as it's racist, I could frame it as ongoing, the ongoing struggle against racism, which, which is to say that like, maybe it's crazy for me to assume that racism really should be over in the first place. That, that we're in a post-colonial reality, we're still working through racism, and that instead of just saying it's racist or not, I could say how, how racism plays out, how race and racism plays out here compared to other places, instead of just labeling it as it's racist, it's bad, it's wrong. You can have a much more nuanced look at it. Okay, okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Fair enough. I went to a, 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 an area today called Capitola, and that was a lot more diverse than, than I thought it would be, okay? Okay, to the characters. Who has the power in my story? Well, racist white people, really, yeah. Do I have too much and am I feeling overly responsible? No, I feel like a victim, really. Okay, do I not have enough? Yes. Can I find agency, my own power? Well, clearly I'm implying I'm navigating things, but that could be really more focused on. The focus could be on me making sense of it and taking care of me instead of focusing on what's wrong with them. <coughs> okay. I'm thinking my voice is starting to go, my voice is starting to, to, to I'm starting to go hoarse. <coughs> Any other characters I could bring into the story? Yeah, I could bring in allies. I could bring in the, the, the I've met several pretty cool white people here since I've been here. I went on a couple of dates too. Uh, and, and I'm not gonna, I don't think dating's gonna happen, but I, I, I appreciated these people's presence. They, and they were totally open-minded and sensitive people. Yeah, they weren't horrible human beings at all. Okay, and who have I cast as the hero, victim, and villain? Well, like I said, I kind of made myself into the victim here. So I've kind of turned uh, white people and racist white people into the villains also. Okay, and then the next one, imagery. Is all the imagery negative? Yeah, mostly, pretty much. Often that's a, that's a common thing in many stories. What imagery are my feelings showing me? They're really showing me my fear. Are they true? My feeling of fear was true. There certainly are things that are I need to be afraid of, but but and and my feeling of fear was coming from a lot from from some internal stuff around my childhood that's coming up to the surface around feeling so alone in a new place. A lot of it was that, and it was hard to to sit with it. Really hard to sit with it. Okay. Are there other senses evidence to include? Yeah, my childhood history that might make me, that, that might make me react in certain ways. Also, just uh, just being from Louisiana and how racism plays out there versus how it plays out here is just very different. You know, it's just very different, very different. Okay. Any positive imagery? Any positive imagery? Well, on some level, me staying home is staying safe. So that's a positive image on some level. Okay, and foreshadowing. It's the ending of foregone conclusion. Uh, no. No, who knows? I could have said screw it and just leave. Am I catastrophizing? Maybe. Will the story really come to that end? It, it could, but uh, maybe not. And what is my vision for how this story could end? Well, maybe I meet some wonderful friends. They're super critical. They're doing amazing things here. I support them. They're interested in me. One of them, one of them turns out to be a super sexy guy and we date. Okay, that could be a vision. That's possible. Okay, and then what are the assumptions? Last one is assumptions. What are the assumptions holding up this story? Uh, I'm assuming I can't leave. I'm assuming it won't get better. I'm assuming I got all those numbers right about the statistics, the racial statistics here. Okay, are the assumptions true? Well, I think they're true. 
but uh, they don't tell the story of what's really going on on the ground. I'd have to spend time on the ground to know that. Are there assumptions that match stereotypes from systemic oppression? Um, I think it's fair to say these are assumptions that match stereotypes from, yeah, systemic o- 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 oppression of white people. I'm making kind of a large assumption about white people, really. And who knows, I may be partly right, but I'm probably not entirely right, so it's probably an assumption. So, yeah, I, I, I can acknowledge I'm making assumptions about white people. Okay. At either rate, it's just an assumption in the story. I'm also assuming that that 1% black population means that they are oppressed or marginalized. That's an assumption. I don't know that, but that's an assumption. And are there any assumptions I have rooted in my own privilege? Well, I have the freedom to pick up and move somewhere else and some people don't. I have enough money to get a very comfortable one bedroom apartment and many people in the Bay Area do not. Um, uh, You know, I'm talking about race on in because it's affecting me, but the other real big issue here in Santa Cruz is clearly homelessness. There's a ton of homelessness, white people, white, white homelessness everywhere here. I'm not really talking about that, although that is the the way, that is a really big issue. uh, My privilege obviously affects how much I talk about race versus how much I talk about homelessness, because I have a home. Absolutely, that's a privilege, so. (sighs) Okay, okay. So then we just, we we go back and rewrite that story. Now I may or may not, let's see. So, you know, I'm, I moved to Santa Cruz because I'm looking for uh, to, to, to accomplish my goals of living closer to the ocean and uh, taking care of myself during COVID-19. Uh, coming here, I discovered it has a 2% Black population, which means that my perspective might be very different than the perspective of, of most other uh, uh, white people who are here. Many of the white people here might not have any sort of experience, contact, or, or positive experience, or positive beliefs about Black people, Black realities, Black life, anything around Blackness. And that, that doesn't make these people... It, 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 this may be a conflict that may occur between me and these people. And that, that conflict, I need, it is up to me to responsibly take care of my feelings and my needs as as when these conflicts arise, instead of just getting mad and hoping people will change. Ideally, I would like to use this time to really deepen my compassion for everyone. So that way I am not a human being who is angry, hurt, stuck in fear or I'm someone who's more loving and compassionate and can do more beautiful things in my life and in the world for however long I have. It. That's what I feel like George, George Floyd taught all of us. That's what every spiritual message teaches all of us. That's what the Gandhis and the Martin Luther Kings of the world taught us too. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, if you go back and look at the way I told that story in the beginning, and the deconstructing beliefs exercise and how I told that story now, those are two very different ways to tell that story, okay? One, one was sort of just my natural complaining self. <laughs> and then the other one is one that's much more informed by all this process of catch a check and change, right? The more I can tell a story this way, the more I can ask myself these questions, the better I can retell all my stories so that way they, they're more helpful, empowering, empowering for me. Empowering for me, okay? I should just say, I, the first time I did this, I did a lot of crying. I did a lot, a lot of crying, okay? I realized that I was the victim of all my stories and I just had a breakdown, okay? So if that's what you're feeling right now, please practice some really good self-care, okay? The idea is to go back and revisit this when you feel you can handle it. And, um, and then to, to take the time out to look at any other stories you tell about yourself. We tell stories all the time about a 
ourselves and other people. And often we don't want to let go of those stories because it means having to admit on some level we don't know everything or we were wrong, or there's something we could be responsible for that we're not focusing on. But needless to say, to whatever degree you are willing to look at your stories, it's another chance for you to get in touch with yourself, your inner life, and empower yourself. Okay. Let me stop this. Put it back on me here. Okay. Okay, so with that, that is the end of our Advanced Emotions for Dummy series. Okay. That was a lot of difficult material in this. And so I have to tell you, my brain is like blowing, okay? Um, the idea is to go back and revisit these things, you know, one of these things once a week. So you can really ingrain this into a habit. Each one of these tools are useful habits for getting to know yourself and your inner life, okay? Starting in August, I'm going to start leading classes on Facebook and Zoom and other places so I can get this stuff out to more people and work with people in real time. Okay, that's the idea. Um, but I just want to say just this last month, it's been a lot. It's been a lot for me. It's been a lot of digging, a lot of getting to know myself. And it's um, uh, it's been super worthwhile. I'm super thankful, but I'm also a little tired. And so, um, and I designed all of this to be a workbook so you could go work on your own problems and not have me you're reading stuff over and over and over again. So I'm still working on exactly what format I want to do this, the best way to go about doing this. But uh, for the time being, I'm going to offer these, I'm going to offer this as a, a, a resource and put it out there as much as I can. Okay. Don't look at me. I've been, I made it a point to start brushing my teeth every day because as an adult, I really should do that, right? It has been having an effect. Check that out. Okay, anyway, I say it as a 38-year-old person. Okay, so anyway, uh, if anyone has anything else to say about this, feel free to shoot me an email at drdonnyemo at gmail.com, D-R-D-O-N-N-Y-E-M-O, drdonnyemo at gmail.com, and I can answer anything. Otherwise, uh, hopefully, I hope, think, I hope this was helpful, and please share it with other people. Please feel free to run through the exercises. Uh, and uh, I will probably link the book of you to all these videos tomorrow. And then, like I said, in August, I will start these classes. So uh, hopefully, if you're interested in any of this, look them up and sign up and feel free to, to take them. Okay. Okay. That being said, thank you so much for your patience, your understanding, your feelings, and for willing to dig deep. Take care and good luck. Good luck being responsible for your emotions. It's no one else's job to take care of your feelings. It is your, your job. Okay? So good luck. Say goodbye, everyone.